uh, today's message is something that uh, while the pandemic was going on, while I was while I was locked locked in, I uh, I signed up for some uh, for the I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Arise. I did the Arise online courses. They were beautiful courses, well put together. But I wanted to share one of the things that I learned, and um, the bulletin said that it's the angel's message. But what I'm going to go over actually will be the uh, the first part, which is then I saw another angel living, uh, flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe tongue and people that's the thing I want to hit up hit up on that what is the everlasting gospel now if you know if you notice that reading prior to uh, verse 6 from verses uh, 1 through 5 God is describing a people that are faithful that are truly uh, have given themselves to God and what is it that they want to do is they want to proclaim this gospel right that's what we all strive to do. We want to proclaim the gospel. So if I stumble over my words, it's because uh, my, my writing is horrible. I, it's got, I'm telling you, this, this COVID has done things to me that I've never thought could, could happen. I, you know, you, you go and think it's not going to happen to me, and then it happens. I had it for three long weeks, and I think I got every symptom there was. And now I have a little, uh, like, resi- uh, I guess they call it uh, a long hauler. So there are some things that... Uh, Sometimes my, my, I, I, I lose my thoughts. I, I go into a, a room and I forget, oh yeah. And then I remember like uh, three hours later and then by that point, by that time it's too late to do anything about it. And it's really, especially at work at the prison, it's, yeah, it's uh, intense. But anyway, what I want to say here is that when we read Re- uh, Revelation 14, 1 through 5, it talks about the character of God's people. And according to 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 and 3, it means that they're doctrinally, doctrinally pure, uh, that they have the pure doctrine of the gospel, they have the spirit of God, that the, the gospel of Jesus. In other words, these people, they are connected with Jesus. And these people love Jesus. And I believe that these people are described in Revelation uh, 14 when they describe the angels, the three angels, because not necessarily are these angels. Of course we know there are three angels, of course. But what is another word for angels? What are they? Messengers, my friends, exactly. And that's what we are. We're, we are messengers. We're here to proclaim the everlasting gospel. And I think that it's not necessarily a little angel that it's talking about, but God's people, that they have it in their hearts, that they have this relationship with, with Jesus as Savior and Lord, and they want to proclaim to the world and that, my friends, to me, is the everlasting gospel. Giving the everlasting gospel, my friends. The three angels' message is given to the church. It's God's last attempt for reconciliation between God and this simple world. The three angels' message was not meant to, uh, was not given to us to to scare people, right? Or, 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 you know, to scare us to death or say, oh, no, no. It, it's a message of reconciliation. And that's the one thing we do, right? We always want to reconcile with someone. We don't want to always have uh, a rancor or, or ill will towards anyone. We want to reconcile with these people, right? Because it's what Jesus would do. Now, and, and the thing is this. Like I say, it's God's last attempt to redeem mankind. And... Um, if they reject this message, there's nothing left that's gonna be, that can be done for them. This, this whole thing, the, the, the everlasting gospel, this, this whole thing is, a, is God's process of reconciliation. You know, it's, we're not here to, to pound and, and, and discourage people, right? We're here to give God, to show God's love. And that's what we need in this time, especially right now. Look out there, my friends. We're living in end times. Excuse me. Now, everlasting gospel. Now, just putting these two phrases together, it's a, it's a unique thing to God. Think about this. There's nowhere in the Bible that you're going to find this term, everlasting gospel. Nowhere. Nowhere. So it should grab your attention, right? And, and the gospel means what? It means good news, right? Good tidings. So it means everlasting 
good news, everlasting good tidings. This message is going out to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people. And obviously this is also going out to people that don't believe in Jesus or don't believe in the Lamb. But it's, it's God's good news to you, to us, and to them. So this is a message, my friend. This is the good news. So is this good news message for them? The good news is defined as um, in the Bible. If we read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Forgive me if I stumble through my words. <laughs> but we're going to go and we're going to see what the good news is defined as in the 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And I will read it. You know, Susan, I forgot to bring your markers. <laughs> your Bible markers. <laughs> and the Bible says this. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declared you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. So we see there you preach the gospel, and by that you are saved, right? Unless you believe in vain. For I have delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's beautiful. That's what the gospel is all about. So in preaching the gospel, what's the first thing? What is the first of all that we need to do? Now, of course, according to, the, to, to God, the gospel is the scriptures, right? It is the scriptures, my friends. So it says here, first of all, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he rose, that he died, and he rose again. That, my friends, is the heart of the, of the gospel. The life, death, and burial of Jesus Christ and his resurrection is, is, a, is the first of, of all of the gospel, my friends. That is the first thing that we deliver to the, to the world, right? That Jesus died and rose again. That is the first thing we need to deliver. The... Now, whose sins did he die for? When we say, when we say well, yeah, he died for all, for our sins, who are the ours, my friend? Who are the our sins? What does the Bible say? Everyone knows this verse. John 3.16, my friends. For God so loved the world. He died for the world, not for just a few people here and there. No, he didn't select someone here or someone there. No, he died for the whole world, my friends. I mean, he, we know he died for the Christians, but my, it's for everyone, for all of us. He came down from heaven. He endured so much pain, so much suffering. He went through everything that we did and that excruciating death on the cross. That is the worst way anyone could die. And, and as you see, all these pictures, of, uh, if you watch the movies of Jesus being crucified, that he wore a cloth. That's not the way they were crucified. They were... They were out there in the elements with nothing on. That's how he died for us, my friends. There's no greater love than that. He stepped down off his throne and came down to us. Would you do that? Would you? You might say, yes, I would, but really, would you? Because we're selfish, aren't we? It's all about what's in it for me, right? What they go, with them? Is that what it's called? Excuse me. My friends, there's no greater love than that. No greater love than that. Hebrews 2.9 2, says that he tasted death for every man, for everyone. He gives a me measure of faith to all of us in Romans 12, verse 3. He's given life and breath to all, Acts 17. So we see here, my friends, he's all-inclusive. He is all-inclusive, my friends. 
And that's what the gospel is. It's all inclusive. It's not just meant, went for one person. It's meant for the whole world. Now, there's a lot of people that, uh, well, why the phrase everlasting gospel? Because it's the foundation, because it was formed from the foundation of the world, right? The land slain from the foundation of the world. There wasn't an afterthought. That's why everlasting. I mean, from beginning to end to end to end. No, it's everlasting, my friends. It was always there. And there's a lot of people that think of us when we talk about it, being saved by grace. A lot of people think about us that we're legalists, right? That we believe in being saved by the law. That we need to keep the law. That, and we do, we do say that. We, yeah, we have to keep the law. We have to keep the law. We have to keep the law. We have to be careful about that, my friends. There's people that suggest that uh, when they talk about the new covenant, it's like they're suggesting that at one time that they'll tell you, no, we're not saved by keeping the law. We're saved by grace, right? That we're saved by grace. We are saved by grace, my friends. We are. But was there ever a time, does it, uh, the Bible actually teaches that there was ever a time that, uh, that we were saved by complete obedience to the law and that was it? No, huh? the Bible doesn't say that, does it? No, it doesn't. Revelation 14 says that this is the everlasting gospel. It's always been the only way people have been saved and has always been through faith, through grace. Always, my friends. That's why you have, in Hebrews 11, it talks about, it says, uh, it's the faith chapter, right? It talks the faith, uh, by faith of Abraham, by the faith of Moses, by faith of Jacob. It's always been the everlasting gospel, my friends, Always. And that's why God put this unique phrase, everlasting gospel, to remind us that there's never been a time that anyone has ever been saved by just, just obedience to the law. We're not saved by obedience to the law. There is no way that the law could ever just save you, my friends. It's grace. By following the law, it's the fruits, right? It's, it's your love. And this was a covenant that was formed from the beginning of time. You know, Romans 8.29. Let's go to Romans 8.29. Romans 8.29 says, For whom he foreknew, he is also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, how long ago did God foreknow? From the beginning of time. Before the foundation of the world, right? Was there a time that he did not foreknow us? No. Ever since God is my friend, see, God is known us. Also, the plan of salvation was not an afterthought. It was not an afterthought, my friends. Hebrews uh, 13.20, I was saying it was a covenant, right? Hebrews 13, verse 20. Hebrews 13, and verse 20. And I'll read. Now may the God of peace who brought us, brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So what is a covenant? What's a covenant, my friends? It is a promise. It is an agreement. It's an agreement between two parties now. Now, was this covenant made between man and God? Because if you make a covenant between man and God, man is going to be pretty bad about it going with the agreement, right? Because we always go this, this way, always. We always go that way. No, this, this covenant was made between the Father and the Son, my friends. Between, it was made between them. This is the everlasting gospel, my friends. No, the plan of salvation was not an afterthought. It was in the heart of God. As long as God was, there's never been not an everlasting gospel. 
There's always been an everlasting gospel. It's always existed, my friends, always. It's who he is. And it was already decided that this is the way they were going to reconcile man. They were going to be saved, not by works, my friends, but by grace. A lot of people say that, well, the gospel only exists in the New Testament, but that's not so. It's not so. I learned something wonderful, and, 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 it, and you'll see it. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. So where is the gospel in the Old Testament? In the Old Testament? Excuse me. Exodus 20. Real simple. This is a very short message, but it's to the point. I hope you guys learn. And if you guys have any more to add, let me know. <laughs> Exodus chapter 20. I'm going to show you where the gospel began. Exodus chapter 20. Verses 1 and 2. Does anyone know what the first commandment is? It's, uh, it's actually when he first spoke. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, okay? And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and then you shall have no other God before me. So there you have, there's the gospel. You want to see why that's the gospel, my friends? What is bondage? Being a slave to sin, right? How did he, uh, how was uh, Israel released from Egypt? What was the tenth plague? What was the very last plague? What did they do? The blood of the lamb, my friends. There you have it. The gospel in the Old Testament, my friends. Only through the blood of the Lamb can you be saved, my friends. Jesus' blood, not the counterfeit blood or the wine of Babylon, which is a counterfeit that leaves you drunk with a um, convoluted doctrine. My friends, it's a, it's a short message, but I wanted, to, I, just had to, I wanted to share this with you because I get excited when I learn something new, and I'll continue to share these things. And, and my next message will be on the rest of the first angel's message about giving glory. Um, I'm going to continue with this. Like uh, I left off with this like three years ago. So I'm starting over again. So let's uh, rewind the tape. But this is my, my friends. I just want everyone to know that the everlasting gospel, my friends, is the very beginning of the three angels' message, my friends. And I, I want you to take that home with you and, and share. I was... Um, I was blown away of all the things that I learned. And you think you know so many things, but when you start opening up, that, that God reveals new things to you. And he's revealed so many things to me. And, 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 and God bless Pastor Schnell for his righteousness, righteousness by faith. That, my friends, is so beautiful, my friends. You know, now I used to struggle with, I forgot to study my Bible today. And I was like, oh, God, Lord, don't strike me down. You know, my friend, let me tell you something. Once you accept Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, You've won his favor. There's nothing else you need to do because once you start trying to earn his favor, guess what it becomes? It becomes works. As we read this, the first commandment, as we read Exodus 20, it's an example of how the gospel is professed. It says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of, out of, of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. What is this showing you? That you once you become, once you love and get to know God, guess what follows after that? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make no, for yourself any card images. Remember the Sabbath day to cleave holy. You shall not take the name of the Lord. You start doing the commandments because what happens? You fall in love. You follow God's word because you love him. You love Jesus so much, you'll do anything. Not because you have to, because you love him. Let's remember that, folks. We're not here to, um, to, to push the law, law, no. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. And guess what happens? The fruits of the Spirit, my friends. You, you take the character of God and you follow his commandment because you love him. It doesn't become a duty or it doesn't become a, 
What's the word I'm looking for? An obligation, yes. It becomes something because you love him. May the Lord richly bless you, my friends. God bless you. It's good to see you again. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your everlasting gospel, God. The fact that you, from the very beginning, loved us so much that you had this plan for us, Lord, to reconcile us, to put us in your image, Lord. Thank you for that. We thank you for the, your son who came and died for us, even though while we were still yet sinners, Lord. Thank you for your words, Lord. And, and if there's anyone here, Lord, that doubts, open their eyes, Lord, and let them have the faith of Jesus in them. Because that's what we need in these times. I ask all these precious things, Lord, of you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.